back. It's 7.36. You're listening and watching Breakfast with uh, Martin and Rosie this morning. We've been asking you who's yeah. working, because apparently the British population say Britain isn't working. Um, a very good morning to Leslie, who says the church is working, well, particularly this weekend, around the clock. Food banks are working. Volunteers are working as well. Um, John, oh, I don't know what we think about this, Martin. He says, are my classes working today if I got up at 4 a.m. to take my wife to work who is? I would say that's half in, half out, but definitely brownie points. There we go. We'll keep your views coming in. GBviews at gbviews.uk. We're sort of rebelling against this idea that a Britain's not working. Yeah. What is? Um, but in the meantime, let's take a look at today's front pages and we'll kick off with the Times. Yeah, the Times leads with rising flu cases and health officials warning anyone with a cough or a cold to avoid spending time with vulnerable relatives and grandparents this Christmas. How do you do that? The Guardian's front page leads on Scotland's new gender laws that were passed yesterday. Their headline is, Number 10 threatens to block Scottish law on legally changing your gender. And the Daily Mail are also leading with Scotland's gender laws and report that the SNP are on a collision course with Westminster after passing a bill to let 16-year-olds change gender without medical diagnosis. The Telegraph, murderer was free to kill after probation blunders. Well, that's the headline. After the probation services are facing a backlash now for deeming Damien Bendel medium risk. And finally, the Daily Mirror leads with the King's Xmas security fears amid concerns that King Charles's Christmas walkabout may be disrupted by yet more protesters, perhaps throwing eggs. Are you an Xmas or a Christmas man? I'm definitely Christmas, although I tend to text Xmas because I'm lazy. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's find out the views of our paper reviewers. Joining us this morning is senior reporter from the I newspaper, Benjamin Butterworth, and also director of operations at the Adam Smith Institute, Morgan Schildenmeister. Thank you very much, both of you, for coming in. Morgan, let's start with you if you can. And the front page of the Financial Times, we didn't bring you that one already. Yeah. Uh, Joe Biden, under scrutiny, what's happened? Yeah, so um, Joe Biden's been uh, criticised by quite a few EU countries and now Kemi Badenoch has joined in and says that the new um, Inflation Reduction Act in the UK, in the US excuse me um, that is focusing on creating a green economy this is an over 300 billion dollar plan um, and they're saying it breaks trade rules because it just uh, it disadvantages um, foreign producers of cars and manufacturers um, and it goes against WTO rules. What's really interesting for me as a, as a long term observer and part of, of Brexit is that this is exactly what Biden complained about about Britain wanting to do mm -hmm. post EU membership, I, as in putting um, grants towards electric vehicle manufacturers, as he's saying here. So it's preferential treatment for buying domestically. And lo and behold, the EU are, are, are unhappy about it. It's, it's a bitter sense of irony, I think, for, for me. Well, let's talk about uh, Joe Biden's potential UK trip, uh, mm -hmm. Benjamin. This is on uh, page seven of the I. He wants progress on Northern Ireland before he's prepared to come over. Yeah, so it's an exclusive in um, today's I newspaper that says that a planned trip for the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement may well not go ahead, or at least Biden won't be a part of it, because he wants that progress to happen. So Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is apparently saying that unless Rishi Sunak comes to a deal with the EU before that happens, then Joe Biden isn't going to visit. Um, and I think, you know, that, that's pretty provocative of, of, the, of the US president. It says that he is otherwise very keen to come because of his Irish ancestry. Now, he is welcome to talk about his Irish ancestry, but it always drives me mad because Barack Obama is just as Irish as Joe Biden. They both had, a, I think, a great-great-great-grandfather leave Ireland in the same year. So Joe Biden is no more Irish than Obama, who didn't go on about it quite so much. Yeah. Um, but I think this will be a, a sharp nudge to someone like Sunak because, you know, the idea of the US sending a message like this that we're not turning up, which is such a big deal when the US president comes, I, I think they're clearly trying to have some soft power mm. here. Yeah, I think it's a bit antagonistic and I think it it makes out this picture, especially in the U.S., we might homeland that nothing's happening and you know the, both sides are not even willing to come to a, a, a conclusion I think people are working very hard to solve this and are trying to keep best relationships as possible and I think this is kind of saying you know we'll put you on the naughty step if you don't behave and back to Biden's Irish ancestry I also find it funny as an American from New England 
whose great-grandfather was born in Ireland. I'm more Irish than he is, but I'm not going around saying that I am Irish because you would all make fun of me if I'm sitting here in the UK saying that I'm Irish and English. Another quick point, especially to you, Ben, I think it's interesting how Biden interfering in, in British politics in this way is seen as a constructive thing or a good thing, whereas when Trump did it, it was chaos. How dare you say Brexit's a good idea? This is the same thing, but the, the liberal press don't seem to object quite as much. I mean, I could easily put that back to you, because I'm sure when Barack Obama said that the UK will be at the back of the queue for a trade deal, I suspect you said, how dare he interfere? So I think totally that, did. I think that goes both ways. I absolutely did. But look, on the case of the Good Friday Agreement, which is what Biden is, is uh, reportedly referring to, the US is a signatory to ensuring peace in Northern Ireland. So, you know, they made a pledge 24 years ago to to stick by that, and, and arguably that's what he's doing by, by nudging Sunak in this way. Yeah. Let's move on to rail fares. Bad <laughs> news here, I'm afraid. Front page of the Telegraph, Morgan, it's, they're going up, and it's the biggest increase since 2012. Yeah, so rail fares have been increasing um, you know, over the years, as, we, as we've seen, but I think what's particularly going to bite this year is you're seeing those increases at the same time that we're having mass disruption with the rail lines, we're having strikes, there's lack of availability of staff, even on non-strike days, so I think people are really going to start seeing, you know, this hurt and ask, are we getting our value for money? It's a 5.9% rise mm -hmm. from March, which actually the government is heralding as some kind of victory, aren't they? Because they're actually um, putting billions towards network rail to try and keep this below inflation, aren't they? So even though it's a 6% rise nearly, the government is saying this is a victory, which is yeah. odd. Well, if you see increases in prices like this, it does have an inflationary effects. So to, to see that it's not rising by inflation or more is, is definitely a, a good point here. Yeah. Um, but I still think consumers will be wondering what their, their money is getting them. Yeah, yeah, mm. right. Let's look at the front page of the Times now, if we can, and there's this question, got a cough or a cold? Mm. Loads of people have been ill, particularly this year. Yeah. Stay away from grandparents. What's the advice, Benjamin? So the UK Health Security Agency, which was the one that had a lot to do with the COVID vaccines and, and became prominent during the pandemic, their advice now is that if you have a cough or a cold, stay away because apparently... There are 9.56 admissions to hospital related to COVID and flu compared to 6.6 .6 per 100,000 uh, last week. So that's, that's quite a sharp rise in one week. I wonder how unusual that is for the time of year, yeah. given how cold it is, particularly in the last week. Um, but they're advising that you don't go near them. Now, I wonder whether... Will this strike the fear that lots of people felt during the pandemic so they'll follow it? Or will a lot of people look at this and say, well, you know, granny and granddad survived COVID, yeah. so as if I'm not going to go, now we've all had our vaccines or whatever. Do you think people will listen to this? I, I kind of hope they don't. And that yeah. goes against how I usually feel about these things. But I just think that, you know, having a moderate cough or a cold is within the reason of, of leading your life. And actually, you know, I think about, you know, my own... I guess, do you think you should tell a grandparent, I'm feeling a little bit unwell, do you still want to see me? Mm. I mean, yes, that might be basic respect, though. You know, because to be honest, any of us, if you have a friend coming over and they haven't mentioned that they're spluttering everywhere, you might have We do talk about that, viruses but, yeah. and illnesses so differently post the pandemic than we did before. Mm. No, I mean, it's true, but look, I, I personally think that if you have a cough, really, not seeing your grandparent at Christmas, it, it seems like a pretty pretty waste of a time. Mm. Do, you, do you think, Morgan, that this this is reminiscent of, of the COVID nudge unit sort of attempt to... That they're saying don't do it because they're trying to get us to change our behaviour, but are people not a bit tired of being told how to live their lives now by the state? Yeah, I think it could be a few things. I think it could be that this is, you know, the new normal, so to speak, where we're going to be seeing a lot more messaging about public health, or it's just that we notice it more because we went through COVID. Like, I, I can't tell you if these messages were in the papers before COVID because I probably just thought, all right, it's just a cold. Um, so it's possible that's kind of a self-reinforcing thing where we, we're noticing it more. Um, but, yeah, I think we're to the point now where people understand best practices for, for being ill at Christmas and are willing to just, you know, use some common sense yeah. and say, look, I'm not feeling well, but let's still see each other. Can I ask something that doesn't make sense to me? In The Sun, page three, mm -hmm. the Christmas song that is number one for health. Yeah, Mariah so... Mariah Carey, why? <laughs> this, is the, this is Mariah Carey's hit um, 
All I Want for Christmas is You. Um, and you hear it everywhere at Christmas. It comes out every year. She makes millions in royalties. But there's a new study that says it actually can lower your blood pressure. Oh. Um, so listening to the song, which I know it can drive most people crazy, um, actually has positive health effects and lowers your blood pressure. Wow. Are you surprised? Yeah, I'd yeah. actually mad to that song. It's yeah. a little bit oh, I love like, it. <laughs> I mean, it's a good song, but you hear it so much that now when I go on my Christmas playlists, I skip it straight away. Oh, I there do. we go. Sorry, I'm Mariah. It. No I Mariah fans behind the desk here. She makes millions a year just yeah. from the, the yeah. royalties of that one song. I think it was number one in the UK about two weeks ago. Doubtless it will be, and the chart comes out later today. Because we've, we've got a guest on that, actually, to we find have. out who yeah. is in the running for Christmas number one. Very quickly, let's just squeeze it in. We've got a lovely story in the mirror about a lady called Hillary. Yes, Hillary uh, Manist, a 93-year-old from, from somewhere, I can't remember where, Derbyshire. Yeah. And um, she goes out and gives biscuits to the Binman every year because she has mobility oh, issues. She has done for a long time. And it's just a sweet story about how she says thank you and, and the Binman saying that it means the world that they can help. And so I think, you know, there are lots of people out there that will be having a hard time in the next couple of days for various reasons. And those small acts of kindness, I think we shouldn't forget them when there's lots of, lots of big issues that these little things can go a long way. I always tip my bin men. I always have. I give a bin man a fiver if I see him at Christmas. I just always have. Just do you? I do, yeah. Really? I've always do you up that early? early? Yeah, when do you yeah, see I've, your bin men? <laughs> well, they're quite late rise. They, they get the, the about nine-ish round where I live. But I always give them a fiver. And, and my postman, Chinese lad. But I'm even surprised you have cash to hand with you at the time that you see them. I always make sure I've got the fiver. I, I just always have done it. Yeah. Right, there I we just, go. Yeah. Benjamin, more 